welcome back to Joy in Dementia. Thanks so much for joining me. I am really looking forward to the interview that we are doing today with a dear friend of mine, Danelle LeBlanc. And Danelle is going to talk to us about how to make the most of a doctor's appointment. So you're probably finding that your forgetful parent is needing to go to the doctor, whether that's just for a regular checkup or you have concerns about possible mild cognitive impairment. So we are going to go through the steps of how to get successful visits because they can be pretty frustrating. And I've heard from daughters how they've been really disappointed by how some of the primary care physicians have sort of just not taken them seriously or do not agree with them that their forgetful parent might have mild cognitive impairment. So we're going to get into a little bit of that. So, Danelle LeBlanc is a fellow certified senior advisor. So I know in past videos I mentioned that I got my certification as a certified senior advisor, which helps me advise daughters like you in what's coming in the future for your parents after they retire. And so Danelle is not only a certified senior advisor, she's also a caregiving consultant and she is a caregiving educator. She is the owner of Caregiver Transitions, which is based in the Dallas-Fort Worth area of Texas. And she has personal experience with dementia as well. She cared for her father-in-law with Parkinson's um, for quite a long time. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And also she combines that journey that she had personally with her professional experience in healthcare. She's had over 20 years in the healthcare field and she continues to carry the light to family caregivers through community training. Um, and she also supports underserved individuals with helpful resources that you can find on her website. And I also just wanna put a little plug in for a, a free course that she just released called Caregiving Navigation. And I was honored to be one of the featured speakers in addition to Tifa Snow. So that was like a huge honor for me. And I will actually put the link to that in the description below. Danelle, welcome to Joy in Dementia. It's so great to have you here. Thank you, Laura. It is a joy to be with you. I really appreciate the invitation. Absolutely. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. So I cared for my father-in-law with Parkinson's and he ended up moving two doors down from my husband and kids and I. And over that period of 12 years, I learned how to be an advocate for him in many different environments. But the most challenging one I think was in healthcare encounters. And so I think a big part of growing into that role as advocates is understanding our power and what we can do to be able to help provide the best quality of life possible for our loved one. It was, of course, informed by my experience working in healthcare and understanding a lot of the, the jargon. But even if you don't have that experience, what we all have as family caregivers is the intent to do the best that we can. And we, there's no one who knows our loved one better than we do. And so that is of paramount value and importance when we go in to see a physician or into the hospital or you know whatever the healthcare encounter looks like, what you bring to the table as a family caregiver is absolutely essential. I have definitely experienced this myself and that the healthcare system does not make it easy for us to understand or work through. <laughs> and so I think we also, as Danelle said, it's really important that we distinguish ourselves as daughters who are involved because as some of us know with siblings that aren't as involved with this caregiving process, there are some that are just like, I don't want to do that, you know? And so some doctors are used to working or not working with those family members. So you can distinguish yourself as not only a daughter, but an advocate for your forgetful parent. 
Yes, absolutely. Establishing ourselves as an advocate, as someone who is interested and involved and engaged in our loved one's well-being is about preparing. So being prepared when we go into a healthcare encounter. And one of the ways that we can do that is, you know, first off is, is making sure, hopefully we've had a conversation with our loved one where we are authorized as a representative to be involved in our loved one's medical care and medical decisions and authorized to receive information, healthcare information from the doctor's office. But if for whatever reason that is not the case, most offices have a provision for some type of authorization to release that information to us during the healthcare encounter. But as much as we can do upfront to have that in place, even if we do not have that information, but we are aware of our loved one's healthcare status, changes in their behavior, their health history, medical history, those sorts of things. Just because there's no authorization for the doctor's office to provide us with information doesn't mean that we can't provide information to them. And that still communicates that we are an essential part of our family member's care. Definitely. And, and Danelle, I just want to put in this note. I think that sometimes we long distance caregivers or long distance daughters feel as though we aren't necessarily caregivers because we aren't living mm. with our forgetful parent and that, oh, well, you know, mom or dad who's taking care of, you know, our parent with dementia knows better because they're with them every day. But you and I have talked about the value of long distance daughters and how that more objective perspective can give us a more, a, a bigger picture of, of trends and maybe what behaviors we're noticing that maybe our caregiving parent isn't because they are, they are adapted, you know, without even knowing. So there is so much value that we can provide. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit later if you're not able to go in person with your forgetful parent to the doctor that you can still be involved. So our first recommendation, as uh, Danelle went into, is that we want to prepare before the appointment. And so really good point that it's ideal if you have the uh, healthcare power of attorney for your forgetful parent, but I know that that's not possible sometimes. So she mentioned the healthcare proxy sheet that you can get from the doctor's office, which is also really valuable. And I also want to add in too that if you can, if, especially if you suspect mild cognitive impairment or maybe, you know, full blown dementia, that you can try to contact the doctor's office before the appointment. But I've seen a been done in certain circumstances is like if you go to the office in person and give a note to the receptionist and say, hey, I'd really like to talk with the doctor before my forgetful parents um, appointment because, you know, I want to give them some context. And since I don't really want to talk about it with my parent in the room, I think it makes them a little uncomfortable. So kind of just uh, trying to give the doctor a heads up of like, hey, I just want to give you some context. Right. And so on that piece of paper, you can say like, please call, you know, Laura at this phone number. And it's like a 10 minute conversation. Right. So you're at least putting that option out there to the doctor. I know they're very busy right now, but um, I know a couple of daughters and actually sons who I recommended this to. So highly recommend that to in order to give context and that way you won't be in that awkward situation with, you know, your for, your forgetful parent or also your caregiving parent and you're like, "Oh, I just want to add that this is being ignored." So this is a good way to do that. Yes, absolutely. And we've had that we've talked about the instances where, you know, maybe we are first starting to have some concerns about cognitive decline or, you know, some form of dementia with a family member or loved one. And the challenges when it feels like our concerns aren't being heard or are being minimized. One of the things that we can do as part of the preparation part, and to your point of, you know, connecting with the medical professional separately, then we can also document 
the changes in our loved one's behavior because oftentimes the physician is going to be relating to that person based on their behavior. In that instance, they may have, you know, some kind of evaluation that they do, but outside of that, they don't have, to your point, Laura, the context, the bigger picture to be able to evaluate what have been the changes over time, what's different about their behavior that is the reason for our worry and our concern, because there's a reason for our worry and our concern. And that if it is not something that's related to dementia or some type of cognitive decline, then what else can we look at that may be causing that change in behavior? Exactly. And this is good for another video, but you know, depression can cause similar symptoms to dementia. Side effects from like interactions with between two drugs can cause it. So it's really important that the doctor is aware of, of those things. Absolutely. So part of the preparation is the documents checklist that we're talking about. So the power, power of attorney or health proxy, the medication list, health history, end of life wishes, describing uh, current health concerns, physical, emotional, and or mental wellness, describing health and or quality of life goals, and what are the, what are the current um, insurance benefits? So right now we are in the Medicare open enrollment period. And so this is a great time if you're watching this video right now to take a look at what your loved one's benefits are. And regardless of whether or not this is something that your loved one is just now signing up for for the first time, or they're needing to make some changes. If you're looking at Medicare benefits for the first time, and even if you're not, then there are so many variables and things change. So we've seen how much things have changed just this year with you know, some of the new benefits that have come available with the CARES Act due to COVID-19. And in 2021, there are going to be a lot of different changes to benefits and eligibility and requirements and some changes to out-of-pocket costs. I know that, for example, with Medicare Advantage plans, there are going to be, with some Medicare Advantage plans, there are going to be some additional benefits. So for example, if your loved one is on an, a Medicare Advantage plan, then it's important to speak to someone, a qualified professional, to understand what new benefits are going to be available, like potentially coverage for adult day services. And each area agency on aging has a department for benefits counseling, which is a free service that is available so that you can call in and get your questions answered. Find out about the best potential options for your loved one. So that's one point. And then with the existing insurance, regardless of whether or not it's a Medicare, Medicare Advantage plan um, or private pay insurance, you want to understand what the insurance coverage status is related to the particular provider that your loved one is going to visit. So you want to make sure that you understand whether or not it's an in or out of network provider or other. And what is the out of pocket cost associated with either being in or out of network. And that's going to vary depending on the plan. So those are some things to make sure that you discuss up front also as part of your preparation process. Yes. And I actually have a video on that about more about Medicare. So I'll put that in the description below, which it gets more into the detailed parts. I do want to also mention that in if your parent has Medicare Part B, the a very initial cognitive screening is covered in the annual wellness visit. So if you mention in your little note to the doctor, ideally you can communicate with them beforehand or, you know, when you're scheduling it, say, I want to schedule an annual wellness visit because they are actually, doctors are supposed to include that cognitive screening in there if they suspect that the uh, patient has mild cognitive impairment or signs of dementia, or if family caregivers are bringing it to them as a concern, they, they, are, they can make the decision whether or not to do that screening. So it would be a good way to do that without your parent knowing 
that it includes a cognizant screening, right? Just say right. Like my annual wellness visit. Yeah. Um, so let's say that we prepared as well as we could, Danelle, for this appointment and we stepped into the office. What is the the next step for during the appointment? Like when you're talking with the receptionist, you get into with the doctor and then we're also with the doctor. Right. So I think that you know, just reintroducing or reiterating our intent as an advocate for our loved one to set the tone for the appointment that is to make sure that we maintain or achieve the best quality of life for our loved one and what that might look like for our particular situation and to document the provider's actions, what their recommendations are, and any language or terminology that we're unclear about, that we ask for clarification. We ask if more detailed information can be provided in writing. And that we also have documented as part of our preparation part, what our questions or concerns are, and that we're also documenting whether or not those questions and concerns have been addressed in the course of that appointment. And so that by the end of the appointment, we can review those, ask the medical provider to summarize or to address any concerns or questions that have not been covered in the course. So we're asking questions, we're clarifying, we're documenting, we're summarizing our understanding, and we're asking the physician to summarize for us as well so that we know what the appropriate next steps are. Yes. And just in case your brain is exploding, because I know my <laughs> mind is a little bit, even though we've prepared for this, there's so many things to remember, right? Because our first yes. step is prepare. Our second step that we're talking about right now is advocate. We are going to talk a little bit later about something that Danelle has to offer you. So you don't need to remember all of the things. To yes. Take so just, yeah, <laughs> just hang in there. We'll get there. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It is so much and it is a very challenging role, regardless of, you know, whatever your background is, it's, it's challenging for us all. Yeah, definitely. And I think too, Danelle mentioned how we want to reiterate that we're the daughter and the advocate for our parent. I think it's also important to come with positive energy and friendly energy and giving this, this office the benefit of the doubt, especially when you're coming in, you're talking with the receptionist, you're talking with the doctor, because it's really about creating this relationship. And, and um, when you give someone the benefit of the doubt, just in your energy and the interaction, they are more likely to help you out and be positive as well. So if you have questions, then the doctor is less likely to be like, oh, are you questioning my knowledge? And more like, oh, let me help you out. And that energy is also going to benefit our forgetful parent because dementia, I talk about how it kind of causes our parents to be sponges of like whatever energy or emotions are going around, right? So you want to try to be as positive and upbeat as possible. So then your forgetful parent feels good. The doctors feel good. The receptionists remember you and they're like, oh, wow, she was really nice because I've been a receptionist before, you know, not in a doctor's office office, but something similar. And I'll, I'll remember you if you were really kind to me, because there's, as we know, there's not a lot of kindness going around with COVID, especially in medical offices. So this would be a really great way to start creating that relationship. Absolutely. Yes, that is so true. It's not just the questions we ask. It's not just, you know, what we say, it's how it's said, right. and the energy and the energy behind that speaking the words, I want the very best possible quality life for my mom or dad. How can we achieve that? And I think it's helpful too. One thing that you mentioned, Nella, in our conversation earlier is that when you say, I'm the advocate for my parent, you can add, you know, I want you to know that I am reviewing my experience here. And so that way, I know I talk with a lot of daughters and I've had this experience too personally where the doctor doesn't take me seriously or they talk to me and not, not at all to my forgetful parent. They just don't even, they act like they're not there. Some negative experiences, we can also report on that. 
So maybe we can go into the third step. Yes, this idea of rating and reporting. Our experience within the healthcare system can impact the rates of reimbursement that providers receive if they're a Medicare provider, for example. And so, you know, I know we live in this technological age where, you know, everyone has a smartphone and all of this, but sometimes just the the visual of having your binder with you where you write things down, you can always, you know, record on your phone so that you have that as a backup. But having a system in place for how you document your care experience and to physically be writing that down. Mm -hmm. And if you do have, whether it's a a great experience with a healthcare provider, you can let them know, you know, I have a great, when I have a great experience with a care provider, then I want to let Medicare know. So I report to Medicare about our experiences within the healthcare system. And you can do that. You can go to medicare.gov and report on your experience. If you were to have a wanting to make a complaint or if you have a concern about a Medicare provider, then the doctor's offices actually with their healthcare providers are required to provide you with a form which gives you the contact information for the beneficiary and family centered care quality improvement organization. They're, the short code is the BFCC-QIO. And usually it's part in the stack of admissions forms that you get. So, but you know, I mean, how many of us actually are physically, you, you mean, you, there's not enough time in the world to review and read all of those documents that we fill out up front. Uh, but that's usually where it is. And there'll be a link to that on this form that Laura alluded to earlier. But if you wanted to report or make a complaint about that is a way to do that. And so Medicare actually has a system where they track and they rate on a variety of different things. So it's on your care experience, but it's also about they have other measures by which they determine up to a five-star rating for Medicare providers. And so if you were to go, this is another thing that you can do up front, by the way, is if you go to medicare.gov and they just upgraded their system like a, co- a few weeks ago, actually, where they have all kinds of different providers. So it's physicians, it's hospitals, it's home care, it's hospice, any type of skilled nursing, any type of Medicare provider is listed and you can look it up by their zip code or the specific name, and you can see their ratings. And that is awesome. (laughs) Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about getting a second opinion, because I hear a lot from daughters about how, well, my parents' primary care physician just doesn't think that anything's wrong and, you know, or does know that my parent has dementia, but they're not open to more, in, you know, any medication period or any innovative type referrals or things like that. I know that was my experience. So what do we do in that case? In the event you have the healthcare visit and physician is unable to pinpoint what's wrong or recognizes it, that it may be some type of cognitive decline to ask, as we talked about before, okay, what else could cause these changes in behavior? And and to ask for some documentation on that so that we as an advocate can follow up. Mm-hmm. So if we know that, okay, it's not not this, or you're recommending that it's not this, that's your that's the assessment. What else could it be? Because you know, we need to figure out what do we do next. Mm-hmm. And um, and to the ex- extent possible to have that in written form. Yeah, yeah. And if it comes to it, you know, the importance of getting a second opinion because yes. every, honestly, every doctor has their own opinion about the knowledge that they've learned through schooling and also their experience. And because we're all humans, right? And so we all have different interpretations of what we see. And so there there is going to be bias no matter who you go to. So it's the idea and the goal is to find a doctor who is on the same page as you and your family. If you didn't have a great experience with that doctor, you didn't feel respected or your forgetful parent did feel respected talking with your parents and seeing like, Hey, do we think that 
maybe we might want to find a second opinion. It's one thing too that I find is helpful is that if you can try to find a geriatrician, because geriatricians have education and experience specific to elders, and especially if dementia is in the picture, they have much more experience working with people with dementia than a primary care physician. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So the three steps we talked about were prepare, and the next one is advocate, and the third one is assess. So assessing the appointment, reviewing, and rating. And Danelle, these are wonderful recommendations. I have a lot of clients who are long distance daughters, whether it's three hours away from their parents or four states across the country from their parents. So what's a good solution if that long distance daughter wants to be involved, but they can't be there in person in these appointments? Well, so in this environment that we're in now, a lot of that is, has resolved itself because of the ability to do telehealth visits, right? And so we can be present in ways that we might not have been able to be present before. And so reaching out with a phone call or via email, like you suggested to the physician's office, just to kind of introduce yourself, helping to make sure that all of the paperwork is in order to help prepare. There is one way that you can help. And because we are in this climate, even if it's not the telehealth visit itself, a lot of the things that need to be done can be done remotely. If you have a family member who is physically present and you are supporting your loved one and you've got you got a dual role cuz you're supporting your loved one and you're supporting family caregiver who may be in close proximity then there are a lot of ways that you can do that without needing to be physically present yeah definitely and two you can also hire a professional for this too. And I actually had thought about doing this for my parents, but they ended up moving closer to me, thank God. But if that wasn't the case, I was really thinking about hiring a healthcare advocate that lived where they lived. Or you could also look into hiring an aging life care coordinator. And if that's something that is outside of your, your price range, or especially now, then looking at other folks, social workers, asking the physician about what community resources and support is available. A lot of disease-specific or condition-specific organizations may have resources or recommendations that they can make to help support you. And then, you know, back to benefits counselor services that are available through your local area agency on aging for your county that you can follow up with that may also be able to provide referrals and resources. Definitely. And I just wanted to put in a quick thing when we were talking about community-based resources to Veterans Affairs. Veterans have really good health care, even better than Medicare in some cases. So if you know, I definitely check with the representative from Veterans Affairs to see what your what your family is eligible for if you do have a forgetful parent or a caregiving parent who's a veteran. Yes, just it's heartbreaking how many people have benefits, earned benefits for a veteran family member and are unaware. So yes, absolutely. Thank you for emphasizing that. Sure, sure. Okay, well, all of these recommendations are great. What's your final takeaway, Danelle? Since that was a lot of information, we're going to find a lot of that on your tip sheet that we'll just talk about. But what, what's your takeaway that you want daughters to remember from this interview? Um, that you are empowered, that you do have permission to ask questions and to clarify and to serve as an advocate and that you belong, you do belong as being a part of your loved one's care team, and that you can influence, you can influence the quality of care that your loved one receives. And so to be tenacious in that, and being tenacious doesn't mean that you've got to go in with, you know. (laughs) Wild cats, yeah. (laughs) Right, but just a, a persistence. Yes, totally. 
Awesome. Well, um, we are going to put a link below. Danelle is going to create a chart your care tip sheet. So I will put that link below for you to access. And that's going to have all the things that we talked about, especially in the prepare section about all the things that you want to write notes about before the appointment. So thank you so much, Danelle, for that. And yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, where can we find you? So I am at caregivertransitions.com. And so you can find me there. And then I will also include my contact information on the tip sheet that I'll be sharing with your audience, Laura. Awesome. Well, thank you, Danelle. It was such a pleasure speaking with you. And I really appreciate your sharing how we can best be the advocate for our forgetful parents when we go into those doctor's appointments. And thank you all so much for watching another interview. I hope that you like this video and that you subscribe as well. So I will see you next time. Bye. Bye.